We are um, working our way through our summer series, message series called A Summer of Parables, and we're looking at some specific parables of Jesus. We're, we are inspired for this whole series by a text by a, a now deceased theologian named Robert Farrar Capon in his book, The Parables of Grace. And so you may have already noted grace. That theme has been finding its way in the music so far this morning, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, and we're still in the Gospel of Luke, and so today we're looking at a parable that's usually called the parable of the narrow door, and we'll get to the parable in a second. There's a little bit of run-up to it in Luke's Gospel, starting in chapter 13. Jesus went through one town and a village after another, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. Then he starts the parable. Here's the parable. When once the owner of a house has got up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open up to us. And then in reply, he will say to you, I do not know where you come from. That's another way of saying, I don't know who you are. And then you'll begin to say, well, we ate and drank with you and and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I do not know where you come from. Go away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrown out. Then people will come from east and west, from north and south, and will eat in the kingdom of God. Indeed, some of Some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Now, if I was another preacher today in another church, this would be such an easy message this morning. I would just tell you the door to heaven is very narrow. Most of you are not making it in. Very few will get there. The rest of you will be left out in the cold to eternal damnation, and then we're done. That's all I have to say. But I'm not that preacher, and we're not that church. So our pathway to understanding this parable is going to be a little more complicated this morning. In fact, I I want to start somewhere else entirely differently. I want to start at summer church camp. How many of you guys have ever been to church camp when you were kids? Anybody here ever be a counselor at church camp? Anybody ever send their kids off to church camp so you can have a week of peace and quiet? Yeah, right. (laughs) So most of you know, I just spent a week at church camp um, with some of our kiddos from here at church, some of our amazing adults that were running the camp, and I had a really great, hot, but a really great week. And my task at the camp was to be the Bible story guy, to teach the Bible story every day. And, And every morning at breakfast, I was supposed to introduce the theme of the day and the word or phrase for the day. And each day had a word or phrase from a different culture that we were teaching the kids about our whole theme, Peace Works. We were teaching the kids about being active peacemakers in the world. And about midweek, the phrase I was supposed to teach the kids was this, this phrase in Spanish, si se puedes, which roughly translates to, yes, we can. And I was supposed to teach the kids about Cesar Chavez and the plight of the migrant workers in this country and, and all that he did to try to protest against their working conditions and the pay and how they were being treated. So you've got to get this in your picture. I'm talking about Cesar Chavez with a bunch of third, fourth, and fifth, fifth grade kids. And I'm trying to teach them this phrase, si se puedes, and I don't know why, but it just got in my head, wouldn't it be great if I got them to do it like you were protesting? So I said, everybody put your hand in the air with your fist and say it with me, si se puedes. And so the kids all put, you guys do this with me, try it. Si se puedes, si se puedes, si se puedes. Now imagine, that's a bunch of 60 third, fourth, and fifth grade kids doing that. It was pretty cool. And I'd say to things like, uh, do you think peace is possible in the world? And the kids would all go, si se puedes. And I'd say, do you think we could bring more love into the world? And the kids are going, si se puedes. And I'm like, do you think we can change the world? Si se puedes. And then it caught on, and the whole week they wouldn't stop saying si se puedes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm fully expecting to get a call from some parent about, what were you teaching these kids? I'm like, it's in the curriculum. I'm just teaching what's in the curriculum. But The other thing the kids, I hope, came to realize, though, is it isn't just as easy as shouting, si se puedes, right? That changing the world isn't that easy, that making a difference in the world isn't that easy, that following Jesus isn't that easy as just shouting, si se puedes. 
Though God knows the church has tried to tell us it's that easy over many years. We've, we have told people in the church that all you really have to do is pray the right prayer or believe the right things or go to the right church or vote in the right way or give just enough money or show up and worship a few times during the year. Uh, don't cuss in front of the pastor. That's one of the Ten Commandments. And if you can do all of that, you're in. We've told people it's that easy. Well, in his book that has inspired this worship series by Robert Farrar Capon, The Parables of Grace, he differs with that quite a bit. He says, actually, the, the path of discipleship is, is simple, but it is not easy. And it's because, he says, if you look at the pathway that Jesus takes through Luke's gospel, it's a path that heads to Jerusalem and it heads to his death on the cross, and Capon says then if we want to follow Jesus, if we want to be disciples of Jesus, we have to follow that same path. It means we have to participate in his death. Now, do I think that Capon literally means we have to participate in death? I think he does. I think he literally means we have to die. So here's my big question for you today. Forget everything else I'm going to say today, I suppose, but take this with you this week. Ponder it. What do you need to die to? What do I need to die to? What do we need to die to in order to be fully human? What do I need to die to to be completely who I was created to be? What do I need to die to to be a person that has a life more full of justice, a life more full of love? What do I need to die to to be a person who more fully embraces God's grace, God's unconditional love for myself and for other people? What do I need to die to? You see, it's a simple question, but the pathway to the answer, I think, is going to be difficult for most of us. Or to use the metaphor that Jesus offers us today, it is, the next slide, a narrow door. Oh, si se puedes, yes, so we can, yes. It is a narrow door. And Capon says in his book that the, the narrow door, the, the idea about it is not so difficult because it's so small that we can't find it or we can't see it or that we can't slip through it. He says the challenge of the narrow door is the idea behind it is offensive to us. Offensive. The idea that we might have to die to something in order to make our way through the door. The idea that we might have to die to the ordinary life that the world has handed to us and all the assumptions about who's worthy and who's not, that we'd have to die to all that in order to make it through that door is offensive to a lot of us. And so he says most of us probably are going to be like the people in the parable who are standing outside the door, pounding on it, shouting at the person on the other side saying, let us in. Making demands saying, haven't we done enough? Haven't we done enough to earn the way into the door? Didn't, hey, Jesus, come on. Didn't we hang out with you enough? Didn't we, didn't we hear your teachings enough? Didn't we eat at your table enough? Didn't we earn our way through the door? It occurs to me that the, the challenge of the narrow door is that we're trying to get through it with a bunch of stuff. So we got all this stuff on our back about who's worthy and who's not, and who's going to hell and who's going to heaven, and who deserves and who doesn't, and we're carrying all this stuff on our back. You know, when I was at camp this week, I had this little backpack that I wore all week, and I carry all my stuff in it. But we had this other counselor at camp who was uh, formerly in the military, and he had a military backpack. Have you guys ever seen these things? I mean, this thing was huge. I mean, it was like this tall, it was this wide. Then he had an American flag literally sticking out, a huge American flag sticking out of the top of it. So I'm kind of picturing that's how some of us try to walk through the narrow door. We have all this stuff on our back. And what's in that backpack? What are we carrying around with us? We're carrying around, like I said, all these assumptions about ordinary living that the world has given us about who's worthy, who's not, who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. Who is deserving and who's not? Who measures up and who doesn't? And then on top of all that, what else have we stuffed in there? We've stuffed in there all of our fears and anxieties about ourselves, about whether we matter really, about whether we measure up, about we're, 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 whether we're really worthy of love from other people or from ourselves. And we've crammed all of that stuff onto our backs. And then we wonder why we can't squeeze our way through the little narrow door. The narrow door of grace. 
because we won't take all that off. We won't die to all that and set it down so that we can just slip right through. And so we're left out in the cold and the door shuts in our face and there we are. So what are we left with then? If that's the end of the story, are we just left with judgment then today? Just judgment? I don't think so. I don't think so. For one thing, consider this. Jesus uses the metaphor of a door. He doesn't use the metaphor of a wall or a barricade. He uses a door. And if a door can open up once, it can open up again and again. And so if the door is open for you today and you don't walk through, it'll be open for you tomorrow and the day after that. Whenever you're ready to die to your ordinary life and all the assumptions the world has placed on you about what's important and what's not, when you're ready to die to all that, let it go. Take that weight off your shoulders and be free to just slip through the door. Jesus also says in the parable, he tells the people, strive to enter the narrow door. Now, if God's whole plan, God's whole plan, in quotes, is that only a few of us get in and then God gleefully slams the door on the rest of us doing this. Ha ha, most of them didn't get in. Why tell us to strive to enter the door? And is that the God that we worship here? I don't think so. And lastly, Jesus finishes this whole part of this part of the gospel by saying this vision he has that eventually the multitudes will come to the door from north and south and east and west. They'll enter the door and they will all party in the kingdom of God in the midst of God's grace. So ultimately, he doesn't end this parable with exclusivism or judgment. He ends the parable with inclusivism and amazing grace. Or maybe I'm completely wrong. Is that possible that I'm completely wrong? <laughs> uh, it is possible that I've completely misread Jesus, that I've got this totally wrong. Robert Capon in his book, and I'm right along there with him, admit that maybe we're trying to find grace in a story that really everybody else is right. It's really a story about judgment and condemnation. But I will say this to you. If, if that's true, what of it? If I have a choice when I read the Gospels between looking at them through a lens of grace and love or looking at them through a lens of judgment and condemnation, I am going to pick grace and love every single time. Amen? And why do I do that? Because as I think about it, judgment is too easy. Judgment really appeals to our sensibilities based on the ordinary life the world has offered to us. Judgment is attractive to us. We kind of like the idea of judgment. Grace, that unconditional love, that idea that God loves us no matter what, that idea is countercultural, folks. That idea is radical. And I think grace is always going to be much more effective at drawing us closer to the center of God than judgment ever will. In fact, if I could extend Jesus' metaphor just a little bit, if the door to grace is narrow, then the door to judgment is wide. And why is that? Because so many of us are more than happy to walk through the door of judgment. Maybe not for ourselves, but we're more than happy to walk through the door of judgment about other people. So maybe... The door to grace is so narrow, not because we don't need to walk through it, but because so few of us will ever choose to walk through it. Because again and again, we're just going to settle for the ordinary lives that the world hands to us instead of accepting the amazing grace of God. So let me ask you, do you think we here at First Christian Church could be people who, when we read the Gospels, try our best to look at them not through the lens of judgment and condemnation, but through the lens of love and grace? Can we be those people? Si se puedes. Yes, we can. <laughs> but I think in order to do that, I have to come back to and leave you today with that one question. Like I said, forget everything else today. Just walk out with this one question. What do I need to die to? 
what fears and anxieties and messages the world has given me about who's worthy and who's not and whether I measure up and whether I'm worthy to be loved. What do I need to die to? What do we as a church need to die to today so that we can step closer to God and step closer to entering that little narrow door of amazing grace? Let's pray together. God of light and love and peace, Jesus challenges us today with this parable. A parable that's read so differently by so many people. Are we wrong today to find your grace in the midst of such a difficult teaching? Help us to find our way towards that grace in whatever way we can. Not only for ourselves, but for those in our lives that we touch each day, that they might know in the ways that we live and the ways that we love a deeper sense of you. And all God's people say together, amen.